got there in the end. Uh, got there in the end, and um, um, in worked in small and all practice in Australia and England. Then I began training as a surgeon. I worked at a variety of universities all over the world, including Florida. Um, we founded veterinary specialist services back in 2000. Now we have four hospitals. It's a big going concern. I teach in prior, as well as my private practice, I teach in the University of Queensland and also in, in Vietnam at Nong Lam University every year. I do a lot of postgrad teaching. Um, married to my wife, who was in my year at university. We have six children, two of them are vets. And I like, um, they're my hobbies, rugby, wildlife, and Cadillacs, and koalas and pugs are my passion. So, these are my children. Um, as you can see, there are six of them. The two on the end, the two boys are both veterinarians and the others have followed different paths. Um, koalas are a family uh, family passion. We all like koalas. Um, we did talking a little bit about koalas themselves. Um, the, the name comes from uh, the word, Aboriginal word, gula, which means roughly translates it doesn't drink because they're not they're not noted to drink most of their water they get from uh, the eucalypt leaves that they eat they're an arboreal herbivorous marsupial native to australia um, they're not a bear they're a marsupial they have a pouch um, and they're quite interesting little animals um, so they're they're typically born uh, after a very short gestation period of four to five weeks. At this point, the little infant crawls around to the to the pouch of the mother, latches onto a teat, and it stays there for um, some months. Um, the, um, about 70% of the marsupial species live in Australia, New Guinea, and the surrounding islands. Um, we have some very interesting animals in Australia, the platypus, uh, and the um, echidna are, are the only still living uh, monotremes. So they're mammals that lay eggs, which is pretty cool. Um, and you can see in the middle down here, a baby echidna, which is like a little porcupine, but um, uh, uh, is, is quite a different animal. Um, in the, the family tree, koalas are probably related closely, most closely to wombats. The wombats are uh, mostly nocturnal burrowing animals. If we go back in history, there was a period um, many or oh, 100,000 years ago or so in Australia where megafauna existed, megafauna, and we had giant um, koalas that were about two meters tall, but no more. So historically, um, koalas were hunted by in the indigenous Australians, but they're they had, due to their knowledge and respect for our land, and it's, they made little impact on koala numbers. But koalas had very, very few predators. Um, the first description of koalas by Europeans um, goes back to 1798. Australia was settled much later than, than North America. And um, the early descriptions were, were quite interesting. Um, in the early 1800s, many, many naturalists came to Australia. It was a time of great discovery um, and uh, an interest. Now, in the late 1800s, koala hunting for their furs began, and this was widespread, and millions of koalas um, uh, were, were killed and their furs shipped to Europe. Can you just hang on for one minute? I've got to shut the door. Sorry, someone's got a meeting happening next door. Um, so many were killed and the numbers never really recovered from that, that time. So we started off um, with, with low numbers. And then um, in the, again in the 1920s, there was widespread hunting of koalas um, and large numbers were killed again, but 
The public outrage at this time led to koalas being given protected st status in the 30s. And after that, um, it became illegal to hunt or kill a koala, which is a good thing. Um, where they live? They live in eucalypt woodlands. They eat eucalypt trees, a gum tree. Now, nutritionally, the gums are very, very poor. Um, they sleep for about 20 hours a day. They're a very sedentary animal. And they tend to live fairly independent lives. Um, and they only, um, they only uh, interact really with their mother, um, the mother and the young, so they're the only real social group. Most of them live within five kilometers of where they were born. They do not travel very far. Um, the majority are found along the east coast of Australia. Um, you can see the star, that's where I, I live there, up in um, Brisbane. Um, there are three sort of subspecies um, down the coast uh, associated with the areas they live in. And those animals are slightly different, but genetically the same. So their gastrointestinal fact tract is adapted to a very high fiber diet with a low nutrient value. They have um, the eucalypt leaves that they eat are actually quite toxic. They, 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 they have these ruminant type in, in sizes and molars. They break down the fibrous leaves uh, and ferment them to extract um, uh, nutrients. They selectively eat uh, about 30 different species of eucalypts, um, which have uh, higher in, in protein and lower in fiber. Their anatomy is very, very interesting. It's not really like any, um, uh, any of the, the animals that we traditionally deal with. Uh, and we'll see some of that as we move along. Um, they're adapted to a, quite a herbivorous lifestyle. Um, they sit, like to sit in trees. You can see a little, a young koala sitting in a tree there. And you can see their front paws uh, their first and second digits are on one side of the paw and third, fourth and fifth are on the other. And that's what they use for climbing. Um, the hind feet they use more for support uh, and pushing themselves up the tree. They are very relaxed animals uh, and they do tend to sit and sleep in trees. And we can see a pretty chilled one there. Um, so I'm just going to show you a little video of a koala climbing a tree. This is actually one of mine patients being released. And it's not a great video, but you can see how they climb using their front paws and their back paws. He was released about four months after a fracture repair. Um, so as I said, they have these ruminant like incisors and molars for chewing and grinding their food. Um, they also have a very small brain, uh, the smallest um, of any mammal in proportion to the body weight. So they're not particularly intelligent. Um, they generate 90% of their energy from digestion in the, the small intestine and from um, hind gut fermentation. You can see there's a radiograph here. This animal has a spinal fracture, spinal fracture. We'll see that repaired later, but we're just looking at the abdomen. It's a large fermenting vat uh, of fluid. Um, so the koala population, the current pop estimates, the population, this is prior to the fires we had last summer. We're between 100 and 200,000 animals, probably nearer 200,000. Um, in, in, in Queensland, the state that I live in, um, and their major threats are um, urbanization and deforestation, which is a significant problem, and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, this was looking at, uh, as a study in nature, looking at um, admissions to uh, koala, uh, to wildlife hospitals over a um, period 1997 to 2013, and you can see that the majority of animals were admitted for chlamydia-like signs. And we'll talk a little bit about chlamydia, not a lot, but a little um, in a bit, but it's, uh, which is quite interesting, but also um, motor vehicle trauma and wasting, which is stress associated, and then uh, uh, animal attack, uh, as well as uh, a variety of other uh, issues. So the threats that, to the survival of the species, the threats to um, 
the, that we face each day really, there, there are five major ones, disease, loss of habitat, predation, road trauma, and inbreeding depression. So disease is probably the biggest one. Um, as we saw, the, the chlamydia um, is, a, is a, a significant condition. It causes um, a keratoconjunctivitis and reproductive tract infections, rendering the animals sterile, unable to breed. And um, the the big problem with this is it's usually brought upon by stress, uh, uh, which is associated with uh, encroachment or loss of their environment. We also see a retrovirus, and the significance of that is really not known. But chlamydia is, is, is a big problem with them. They can be treated, but once they're ill and badly, uh, badly uh, affected, they won't go on to breed again, which is a big problem. Uh, Another big problem is our loss of habitat. We can see down here on the uh, east coast of Australia where the majority of our population uh, lives and that's the area where the majority of, of koalas are. So humans mostly here, koalas also. And that's a big problem because um, we take the habitat from koalas. And in Australia, there's a lot of clearing of land. We start with um, eucalypt forests, and this is actually happening just, just near where I live. We see um, clearing of that land, new subdivisions being built, and we end up, we move from forests to housing fairly quickly, unfortunately. So um, that's a big issue that, that we faced and we face and um, does cause problems. Um, predation, historically, the only real, um, real predator is our large pythons. Um, uh, it, with the younger koalas um, and dingoes, which is a, a, um, a, an introduced animal, but an introduced a long time ago, um, about 40,000 years ago. We, however, when um, Europeans came to Australia, bought domestic dogs, and this has a huge impact on koalas. And many of the animals that I see are um, uh, victims of dog attacks. And it's very, very difficult because um, antibiotic use is very difficult with koalas. Um, their hindgut fermenters and uh, altering their gut fermentation can lead to gut stasis and, and death. But we do see a lot of koalas um, lost to snakes as well. This is my slide for people who don't believe snakes eat koalas because we have very big pythons in Australia and they eat kangaroos, they eat um, crocodiles, um, and as I said, they're, they're big animals. Um, this little chap is the world's most venomous snake, lives in Queensland, out in the western, western um, part of Queensland. Um, we thankfully don't see him very often. Um, He's called the small scale snake, or um, uh, he's an inland taipan. Next thing is road problems. And as I said before, koalas are not particularly intelligent animals and they're quite prone to sitting on the road uh, and they, unfortunately they get run over. Now, what um, we do is we will build little overpasses and you can see one down here that's across a road between two areas of forest. And, Many councils and local, local government will do this, but still we have problems with koalas on the roads. This is a picture of the number of koalas that were killed in a single week um, on the outskirts of Sydney. So it's very common that unfortunately during breeding season when they come out of the trees that um, to breed they get uh, are run over. You can see a number of these animals have quite marked discoloration around the back end and that's associated with um, chlamydia infection, unfortunately. So we have increased public awareness. We try to, um, if we have uh, areas where koalas are evident, we, we will um, fence those areas and also reduce the speed limit for people. Inbreeding depression is a big problem. When we have low population numbers in areas, and forced isolation by roads and fences, um, we've had significant problems with inbreeding. So some of the populations uh, are, are quite inbred and we're starting to see some issues associated with loss of genetic diversity in those areas. So, you know, in 2012, koalas were declared vulnerable. 
um, but research uh, currently shows they probably should be critically endangered. Um, we, we are, um, we do have a, a big loss of koalas and recently the fires um, over 2019, 2020 were, um, uh, we lost a lot of koalas. So what happened? We had big, we call them bushfires, they're like forest fires between 2019 and 2020 over our summer period. And Australia lost about 12 million hectares of land. At least 32 um, people were killed. Um, 2,700 homes. Um, but it, it was estimated that about 1.25 billion animals were killed in that time. Thousands of koalas, kangaroos, wallabies, uh, birds were, um, were very, very badly injured. And the fires, when they come, uh, 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 horrific, really. They, the eucalypts, which cover Australia, the gum trees, um, produce volatile oils. And the trees are actually, when the fires get going and the fires go through, the, the trees will burst into flame or even explode because of these volatile oils. The koala, koalas were particularly um, uh, badly hit. Um, up to a third of koalas uh, in Victoria and New South Wales were killed which is, um, is quite horrific. This is a, a little video from a carer, um, as a, from, from a firefighter, from a little koala who's just come out of the a burnt area. Um, he did survive that little chap. So it's estimated that, as I said, about a third of the koalas in New South Wales um, and we do need to remember Australia is home of some of the Earth's most distinctive animals, in particular our marsupials. Um, and the um, loss of these animals is, is, uh, is quite uh, difficult to bear. And um, We've probably lost about 34 species over the last 200 years, um, which is, is, is quite tragic, really. There's an island called Kangaroo Island um, off the coast of South Australia. The fires there were terrible. Um, they, they lost about 25,000 koalas in that area. So um, we'll probably never know the exact numbers of killed, uh, of koalas that were killed, but, but there were a lot. And, and we really, at this point, don't know what effect that will have on the survival of the species. So that's all sort of doom and gloom, but what can we do to um, help these animals. Now, this is a man who's a very good friend of mine, Steve Irwin. You, some of you may have heard of him. He set up a, um, uh, a zoo and a wildlife hospital just north of Brisbane. Steve tragically passed away some years ago. Um, and they have a, a, a wildlife hospital which works on, um, uh, on, on wildlife. Uh, it, was, it was built there and um, is, is an amazing place. Now, we started veterinary specialist services in 2000. A couple of years later, I had a phone call from a fellow called John Hanger, who was the head vet there. And he said, they had an injured koala, would we be able to help them? And I said, yeah, of course, of course, bring it down. And so that phone call began our association with Australia Zoo. Um, and we um, work continually with them to try and support um, uh, and maintain the wildlife that they have. Um, they see about about seven and a half thousand patients per year, um, many with chlamydia, but the road attack and the dog attack are the ones that we um, we try and help them with. Um, so our treatment goals are very very strict. Um, if we're going to spend a lot of time and effort in in um, treating these animals, then they they they're all microchipped and ear tagged but they must be disease free. There's no point for us repairing a fracture in a, in a koala that's rendered um, uh, sterile and is sick with chlamydia. So we don't treat those, unfortunately. So they must be able to live independently and they must be also be able to re be released within five kilometers of where they were found because as I said before, they're territorial animals. They like to stay in the one area and moving koalas does not work. Um, they do keep a small number of patients um, for, for breeding um, and then they'll release the offspring. So some that are too badly injured to, to, to be released but, but are capable of breeding 
are kept. This is a, a little koala down here called Stewie. Um, he, he had a, uh, a cervical fracture and we'll see him later on. So how do we contribute? We provide um, diagnostic services, advanced imaging, radio, X-ray, CT, MR, endoscopy, and surgery to, to the um, wildlife hospital mostly involves surgery, primarily long bone surgery and spinal fracture repair. The animals come to the hospital um, as, as day patients and we treat them and then they're taken back to, um, to the zoo for rehabilitation. When I started doing surgery on koalas, um, it was very difficult to find any anatomical text. There's no veterinary surgery, small animals for koalas, unfortunately. Probably the best anatomical description was published in 1882, which is a long time ago. Um, but there is a little, uh, another more recent journal, but the best one is that one by Young back in 1882. And that's where we get most of our um, uh, anatomical knowledge. Koalas have very strange bones. These are the humerus. They have a, a big flat, um, distal humerus. Uh, it's very unlike any other animals. Um, and they also have um, uh, quite interesting long bones. They do need to be able to supinate and pronate. So if you have radius and ulnar fractures, they, they're usually repaired uh, independently. Um, they have very straight bones otherwise. Um, their, their femur and, and um, and tibias are very straight, and they have these epipubic bones, which we also see obviously in dinosaurs, uh, which is quite interesting. This is a skeleton of koalas I have. It's actually just over here behind me. I like this picture because it's got a sort of Jurassic Park-like theme with the, the shadow in the background. You can see the epipubic bones sitting up here, and they support the abdomen while the koala is sitting in the tree. Um, having this, I have to have a license from our national parks to be to own the skeleton. I'd actually own it, they own it, but to have the skeleton, I, I need to have a license. Um, so we're very fortunate to, to have that. So our broad principles of fracture repair, you can't use bandages. Um, koalas won't have bandages, they will take them straight off. Um, most of them are repairs with nails or plates. We always use intradermal sutures. And it's interesting that their physes stay open for th until three to five years of age. So we'll see physeal fractures, growth plate fractures in adult animal animals, not uncommonly. Um, so patient selection, um, we need young, healthy animals, particularly females with young, open fractures we're not able to treat um, unless, because they're very commonly badly infected. Um, and the reason for that is we, we can't use antibiotics on koalas. Um, as I said, we'll use a single surgical dose, but beyond that, in, um, ongoing doses does lead to, um, to uh, a issues with, with, um, with um, changing the flora and uh, uh, bacterial overgrowth and uh, sepsis and death in these animals. Um, on the good side, they don't do very much. They have a very sedentary lifestyle. They sit in trees. So um, um, post-op care is, is much easier. Um, anesthesia is quite difficult. Uh, the koala's larynx is a long way in and it's, um, they don't open their mouth very much. So intubation is quite difficult. Mostly we'll pre-med with acepromazine and methadone. We induce them with alfaxalone, which is uh, the anesthetic of choice we have, and maintain them with isoflurane. Post-operative analgesia, we use fentanyl, methadone, and carprofen. Um, they're confined. Um, sometimes we'll remove implants post-operatively. Uh, very often we won't, and we aim for a release at about four to six months post-operatively. So rehab post-operatively, we, we increase um, their enclosure size, allow them to do a bit more. We'll see a couple of examples of that later on, and then eventually they're released. Um, 
and they must be released within five kilometers of where they were where they were where they were found. So complications, normal complications we see. Um, our biggest issue is, is infection um, because of the difficulty using antibiotics. But occasionally we'll see delayed union, malunion, non-union, implant failure, and so on. Not very commonly, but they do occur. Um, koalas heal very, very slowly, unfortunately. So let's look at a case. This is a, a, um, a, a three-year-old male called Thomas. He was a healthy dog, a healthy, healthy little chap, and he has a mid-diaphyseal femoral fracture. Uh, we see his fracture there. And we, it's just a fairly common fracture, both from uh, road trauma or, um, uh, or occasionally um, falling from a tree, which is probably what happened with him. He was found in the forest, nowhere near a tree. So lots of different fracture op options there. It's a transverse fracture, so we couldn't just use a pin, but we could have put a plate on that, or in this case, we've used an interlocking nail. Um, those nails we tend to leave in place uh, and they do go on to heal. That's my son, Bill, um, who's a, a fifth year vet student or finally a vet student. He uh, was in at work that day for the surgery. Um, and he went on to heal post-operatively. We had methadone, avoid antibiotics. He was confined for a period and then released uh, about uh, four and a half months post-operatively. Uh, he did very well, that little one. Um, humeral fractures, the humerus, as I said, very strange looking bone in, in the koala. Um, the radial nerve goes over the top of that notch there. Sorry, uh, uh, radial nerve, sorry. And it's this big flat bone plate is quite difficult. Um, this was a, 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 an animal called Toro. Um, he was another male uh, in very good condition, and he was hit by a car. Um, he had an awful fracture of the left humerus, left distal humerus fractured here, as well as the alacranon uh, of the ulna. So we repaired him with two little plates and um, a pin and tension band on the, the, the um, ulna there. And you can see me with him there. I particularly like that photo because you can see how closely my beard hair matches the color of the koala. That was a joke. I know I can't hear you laughing, but I'm sure you all are. Um, he did great. That's him being released six months later. Um, so th these pictures of their release are really what it's all about, you know, being, being uh, able to help these animals, have them released back into the wild. You can see he has an ear tag on, uh, and they're all ear tagged and microchipped when they're released. This is a little one called Perry, um, another male. It fell from uh, a tree and you can see we've got a nasty spinal fracture here at uh, T13L1. Um, despite the fracture, um, he was in reasonable condition neurologically. So we went on and repaired it, um, repaired the fracture. Uh, and what we did was we placed little little K wires across the facet joint for temporary immobilization, put screws in place, and then methyl methacrylate to hold that in place. And that's post-operative radiographs. Um, he took quite a while to recover, but eventually um, was released eight months post-operatively. That's him up a tree. So, you know, again, we're able to help this animal um, and get back into the population. Um, we then, we had a couple of, of um, cervical fractures, which were quite interesting. Um, uh, two, one, one, one week and one the following week. So this is Mr. Glee and he had a cervical fracture, a fracture luxation at C5-6. And interestingly, koalas have quite thick pedicles. Um, the, the, the lateral lamina of the vertebrae is quite thick. So I used a technique that we do in people, um, not that I do in people, but human surgeons do, of putting screws down the pedicles to maintain uh, these fractures. And that's using pedicle screws. 
and and he went on and did very well okay that's him 12 weeks post-op you can see he's very fond of me um and then the following week we had this case um his name was stewie um he had uh fractures at three four and four five fracture luxations at both those sites um we used a similar technique um you can see the fracture being there that's myself dave cook uh rachel and one of the anesthetists from the zoo um so we've placed pedicle screws on both sides of the um uh of, of the repair and that's his post-operative images and he recovered very slowly he did have deep pain evident and normal reflexes in his hind limbs but he um he was very slow to recover he spent uh several months sitting in a high chair in a nappy uh and people would bring him food like a king um but eventually he was released um i think about nearly nine months post-operatively uh, we saw him being released in a, a picture earlier on um and then fran fran was a very poorly behaved koala um she was a very young female with um with uh, a pelvic limb fracture and young females with no evidence disease of disease we do everything we possibly can to rehabilitate these animals um, so she has fractures here of the proximal femur and also a physeal fracture of the distal femur so quite nasty fractures that's the the unaffected limb um, so we ct'd her and we got some pictures here of the fracture proximally and distally. And that's her being prepared for surgery, um, Anita and Rachel. And Will and I putting her fracture back together, or fractures back together. So we used um, some K wires distally to repel that distal fracture in place and a plate proximally. Now, because she was so young, we decided to remove the implants. Um, as I said, she was quite a badly behaved koala and kept escaping from her cage. Um, so they put her in an enclosure, so, which is, this is her here on the top, sitting on another koala's head. Um, six weeks post-op, everything's healed and we removed the implants and she was later released um, but she was a dear little animal uh, that's her after release up the tree it's not a great photo but that that is her up there so the last case i'll show you is some terrible radiographs this was an animal named maddie she was a very special koala she had bilateral femoral refractures repaired in 2014 with interlocking nails. And she was found, uh, she was released. And then four years later was found, they knew who she was because of her ear tag and microchip. So they took some x-rays with her conscious just to see how the implants were doing and they were doing fine. But more importantly, this was her when she was found and she had a little Joey. So it sort of tells us that the animals we do help that we do repair go back and breed and that that's a very heartening picture for us because without the effort we put in we wouldn't have uh, that little joey there so we've contributed to the release and treatment of over 400 uh, native animals we koalas kangaroos echidnas possums gliders tasmanian devils uh, which we have issues major issues with because of their devil facial tumor syndrome birds dugongs we see quite a few of um, they're like your manatees um, turtles and reptiles and on all, all the work we do um, is pro bono we don't charge for any of the work uh, that we do um, sorry so our approach to treatment of these animals 
Um, we're very happy to provide a high level of surgical medical skills to our native animals, especially the vulnerable and endangered species. We don't charge for any of our work. Um, we do have requirements that must be met. They need to be um, have a good, the goal of release. So the, the, any animal that's injured, we need to be able to release that animal long term. Um, the aftercare must be of a high standard. So these animals must come in through uh, a wildlife hospital. So we know that they're going to go back and be rehabilitated. We don't take um, animals from the public. Well, we do, but we send them to the to the the hospitals, the wildlife hospitals, to be assessed before we do anything with them. Um, so we work with Australia Zoo, the RSPCA, Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary, and Corumban Wildlife Hospital. They're the only places we work with. And we do surgery, internal medicine, imaging, cardiology, dentistry, ophthalmology, dermatology, physiotherapy. And it's really been a privilege to do so for the past nearly 20 years. Um, it's, uh, it's something that we do as well as all our private work. Um, we don't get any income, of course, from, this, from the um, uh, wildlife work that we do. But we accept that because we're contributing to the survival of these species. And as I said, that picture there of Maddie uh, really is the um, the reason we do it. And that's to see the the the, the joeys um, come through after uh, an animal's been released. So. Um, that's really all I have. And, and what I'd encourage you to do with your careers is not only focus on what you can do for, um, for yourself, your family and your practice and your colleagues, but also what can you do for um, animals in a worldwide, worldwide basis, you know, taking in and, and rehabilitating strays, taking in and rehabilitating um, wildlife. All these things are important as well. It's important that we use our skills not just for um, paying paying clients, but also for those who can't afford to to um, to pay for the services that we provide. That's just a cool CT of a koala with a joey in her pouch. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. Um, if oh. anyone has any questions, I'd be very happy to to answer them. All right, so there's two ways to do questions. Uh, you have the ability to unmute yourself now um, and ask questions, or you can um, ask questions in the chat below. Um, but you have the ability to unmute yourself and ask Dr. Moses any questions on this amazing work. All right, so um, Javi had a question. He said, since their rehabilitation is so long, are you worried about imprinting and what is done to prevent it? Um, they are mostly in small enclosures in, um, in the hospital. So they're not, they're not sort of um, rehabilitated in cage. They're mostly rehabilitated in enclosures with other, with other koalas. So the, the, the focus there is to try and give them little environmental groups like they would have, um, uh, particularly in the young animals, um, rather than too much time with people. So as soon as they're capable of being put into enclosures, they are, and you'll see a lot of the pictures we have, um, they're, they're, they're not sort of in a cage, they're in, um, uh, a small enclosure with with really short trees that they can't climb very high on, um, and that seems to be the best way. They, they do, koalas do not like sitting on the ground; they like to sit in trees. So, even when they're they're immediately post op, we try and sit them in a, a the fork of a tree, but it might only be two feet high. Um, so, it's the focus is always to get them back into um, the uh, more natural environment. I've put my email address there if anyone does have any uh, questions later that they wish to send me or, 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 or anything at all, um, you're most welcome to. Awesome, awesome. Did that answer your question? It's a really good question. 
All right, you got some compliments on here. It just says that, you know, they love this. Um, just what they need to get motivated. Somebody was watching with their family and said they really enjoyed it. Um, Gracia, she had a question. She said, do you see a tendency in rehabilitating more males or females? Do males get injured more often than females? Yeah, they do. Males do because the males travel during the breeding season. Uh, there's only a short breeding season um, uh, and the males will come out of the trees and, and go looking for, um, for females. So um, that, that's when we see a lot of animals hit by cars and dog attacks um, and they do tend to be more males than females. But males are important too. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, Paige asks, not sure if I didn't catch her or not, what was the purpose of the distal humerus being so different in koalas? Um, it's, it's associated with, um, with its muscle attachment, um, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, that sort of, I've done a lot of dissections on, on dead animals, um, ones that have come to us um, uh, or I've been able to secure a, a, the body after they've been uh, were, were killed and dissecting and having a look at them it seems to be associated with muscle attachment um, they're not they don't walk on their front legs very often they're mostly hot in the trees um, and I think it's associated with muscle attachment that's the only explanation I really have excellent excellent um, Katie Act, you had mentioned a lot of human factors contributing to inbreeding depression. Given that koalas don't travel far from their birthplace, is there any evidence of inbreeding depression occurring naturally in addition to being exacerbated by human infrastructure? No, historically it doesn't seem to. Although they don't move very far, they will uh, move into other areas that are close by. So you do see um, in the the normal normal um, environment, as in without um, without uh, settlement in the area, there is some migration between um, between populations, um, but not a lot. But males do tend to travel a bit further than females. Excellent, excellent. All right, we have another question on here, and a lot of thank yous from everybody. Um, how exactly do the koalas respond when released outside of that five kilometer radius? We try and we, the focus really is to um, release them back within their, their, where they were found. Um, it's, it's, it's important. If you release them a great distance away, um, if it's an area that's populated by the koalas, they tend to be um, uh, uh, pushed out of that area by the other koalas. Um, if there are no other koalas, then it's not a big problem, but they do tend to try and go back to where they came from and offer it, often injured in doing so. So they, they do seem to like living where they live. Okay, excellent, excellent. Julia asks, um, what is their personality like when working, when working with them? Do you use tranquilizers or some other form of restraint? No, not typically. Most of them... Um, Unless they're frightened, you can hold them, right? Even wild ones, they'll sit on you. The problem is they'll try and climb up you sometimes, and those claws are quite big. So um, it's not, they're not attacking you. It's just that they might climb you if they're frightened. Um, and they can, um, they can do a bit of damage with those claws. So we're just careful with them. Um, they don't like being petted, but... Um, if you just hold them, most of them are, um, uh, and they're not frightened, they'll just sit still. I want to hold a koala. All right, so another question is, how well do koalas see, and how well is their hearing? The hearing is very good. The, their vision is not great. Um, so they, 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 their hearing is quite acute, um, uh, but, but typically their vision is, is not their best sense. Sense of smell is quite good too. Excellent, excellent. Um, Maddie just wants to say it's really nice to hear stuff like this when stuck at home all day doing schoolwork. I can't wait to get into the field and really start helping animals. And this reminded me of that. Oh, and Maddie. That's good. 
Maddie the Koala. <laughs> Dr. Townsend said, thank you so much. Um, Floyd, thank you so much. Oh, we have a question. All right. So Rochelle asks, how often do you see orphan joeys and how do you rehab and incorporate them to other populations? Okay. Um, orphan, I don't, that's not an area that I do. I mainly do the um, surgical repair, but the wildlife hospitals, sometimes they will find a, a female that's been injured with a joey. Those joeys, they do try and, um, uh, and rehabilitate. They're very difficult. It's, it's, because they're born so um, prematurely in, for, or for, from our point of view, um, they're, they're small and pink and hairless. Um, if they've got hair, you can probably save them. Before they have hair, it's more of a struggle. So they're bottle fed. Um, they uh, will try, they'll usually, if they can't, but you can't put it into another female's pouch. That's not gonna work. Um, You've got to bottle feed them. They, they, people will have a little pouch they'll have around their neck and put down the front of their shirt to keep them warm and bottle feed them until they grow, uh, until they're old enough to be um, introduced to, to foods. Uh, and then they will, will try and re, um, release them. Often those, those ones that have been um, hand reared though will not be released in the wild. They'll be kept in breeding programs. Hmm. Um, David Sanders, who was supposed to be interning with you this this summer, he asks, "Hi, David. How do you, <laughs> how do you manage um, funding for your work?" Ah, uh, we donate all that. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so we donate our time and implants and our experience. There's no, we don't charge anyone. It's just, um, uh, it's just uh, our donation to the. Um, wildlife of Australia. Wow, wow, that's big. Um, I guess that's why we charge so much. It's why we charge so much for our private patients. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, but yeah, it's it, yeah, it's and also it's good for you know when a koala comes in, it's good for the staff love to see it. The um, you know it's a really good good feeling uh, when that happens, and and most of them were able to help. Um, so, you know, it's not, it's not a, a funding thing. It's just, we do that because it's a good thing to do. Excellent. I'm sorry we haven't, weren't able to see you, David. <laughs> next year, next year. Always welcome. <laughs> all, all, all students are, uh, are always welcome. So if you are interested in coming to, to visit us, please do so. Excellent. Um, Samantha said, this was so expiring. Thank you so much. Dave said, thanks. I look forward to it. Um, as we're nearing the end, are, is there any final words that you want to give to these um, veterinary professionals um, in just how you were, were fascinated by your, your um, clinic's a, approach to um, conservation? Is there any information or any um, words of inspiration you want to give to these veterinary professionals here? Look, I think just enjoy, enjoy the profession. You know, it's been, I graduated in 1986, which was obviously before you were all born, but you know, I've had a wonderful time being a vet. It's been really, really good. I've been able to travel all over the world. You know, I've I've chosen the the um, specialty of, of surgery, and I've been able to contribute to in a lot of ways with that. But it's a wonderful profession. You you spend a lot of your time helping people and helping animals. So you know, graduate and go and enjoy it. It's it's a great great experience. And if you can travel, travel. Um, uh, look at working in 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 other other um, in other places uh, as well as as the states. You know, I know I know you guys often graduate with quite with a lot of debt, but um, you know it's it is if you can work in other other areas in other other countries, it's really eye opening. Right, and you don't you know I work in a big referral hospital with CT and MR and, and, and all the surgical equipment that your, your faculty has as well. But I also work and teach in Vietnam and they have nothing. Um, you know, I go there every year, I teach at the university and I do some postgrad teaching and then I try and do some, some um, prax and, and do some uh, private practice, uh, working in private practice a bit to help them. 
um, it's just eye opening and, and, you know, people can um, do a lot of things with, without a lot of equipment. So as I said, you know, enjoy the profession. It's a wonderful profession. Um, it's, it opens a lot of doors and let it open your eyes and travel around the world. Excellent. Excellent. Well, we want to thank all of you all for joining us. Let's give a big thank you to Dr. Moses. There's many thank yous in the comments, Dr. Moses. Thank you for this. Um, yeah, it was amazing. It was amazing. Thanks for sharing your wisdom and your experience with us today. We truly appreciate it. My pleasure. I'm happy to do another one some other time. Oh, yeah, for sure. We have nothing okay. but time. We're at home. <laughs> all right. All right. Yeah, same here. Same here. Stay, stay home, people. <laughs> Don't go out. Okay, take care. All right, take care. Take care. Thank you, everybody that came. Take care. See you all later. See you now. All right.